interesting argument. He says, against this seems to be that then from this evasion, the whole way of proving univocal unity of some concept was seen, would seem to be destroyed. For if you say that man has one concept for Socrates and Plato, it will be denied you, and it will be said that they are two, but they seem one because of their great similarity. If we abstract Scotus's worry away from the immediate dialectical context of engagement with Henry, we can um, more generally state his worry thus. If, analog if analogous concepts are so similar to each other that they can function phenomenologically and logically, just as a univocal concept can, then we uh, have no way to show that any of our concepts are univocal. I will call this general worry the symmetry challenge. The thought is that there is a symmetry between the phenomenolo phenomenological and logical properties that we want our concept of being and our genus and species concepts to share. For instance, it seems like there is one concept of being and not several. Further, we want uh, both concepts of being and of genus and species to be able to be used as middle terms in valid syllogisms to be able to serve as the basis for contradiction. For example, it's a contradiction to both be and not be, and to be an animal and not to be an animal. As such, there is symmetry between reasons for thinking that being is univocal and that genus and species concepts are univocal. If you think analogy can do the job in the uh, former case, um, you won't be able to argue it cannot do the job in the latter case in an effective way, an unwelcome result. The best way to evaluate Scotus's symmetry challenge, I claim, is to look at the Thomistic responses to the Jesuit nominalists who held precisely the position that Scotus warned of, thinking that being and our genus and species terms are predicated analogically. Okay, jumping forward in time. Since the beginning of the scholastic debates between uh, analogy and university of the concept of being, different, uh, different theories of what it takes for a term or a concept to be univocal or analogical have abounded. In short, the terms analogy and univocity have not themselves been used univocally. This is no less true in the 17th century, but by then some helpful developments have emerged and some of the participants in the debate have come to an agreement of what analogy and univocity are. The first helpful development uh, by the 17th century is the systematic use of the distinction between formal and objective concepts. Uh, we've seen this before in, in earlier talks, such as Andreas's. Um, the formal concept is an accident in the soul, which is that by which one conceives of something. The objective concept is the intentional object of the formal concept. That is, what is made present to the mind by the formal concept. The second helpful development, development is the explicit discussions of objective versus formal precision. The theories of objective and formal precision are theories of how we can grasp identical items by means of diverse formal concepts. For example, we form distinct formal concepts of Socrates' animality and rationality. According to the nominalists who defend formal precision, when we form distinct formal concepts of Socrates' animality and rationality, each has one and the same objective concept, namely Socrates' nature. But by different confused and imperfect cognition of Socrates' nature, we cognize Socrates' nature as differing from non-human animals, that is, as rational, or as not differing from them, that is, animality. In contrast, according to the Thomists and Scotists who defend objective precision, when we form distinct formal concepts of Socrates' animality and rationality, corresponding to these distinct, uh, corresponding to these are distinct objective concepts of rationality and animality. That is, even though rationality and animality are identical, one can be cognized without the other being cognized. These are not two confused cognitions of Socrates' entire nature, but instead distinct cognition of his animality alone and his rationality alone. Also by this time, some Thomists and Scotists have come to an agreement on what exactly the debate between themselves consists in. This group of Thomists and Scotists ag agreed that for the concept of being to be univocal is for there to be one objective concept of being common to God, substances, and accidents. Um, in contrast, uh, the Thomists who, who uh, agreed with that, with the definition of univocity, defended the broadly Cajetanian line that there are many different rationes of being, which are nevertheless one by proportion or similitude. Consider, for instance, how uh, the Princeps Scotizarum or Ptolemyo Mastri defines equivocity, univocity, and analogy. This is a uh, text two on the handout. He first gives Aristotle's definition of equivocity, 
where equivocals are those things, quote, the name of which is common, but the ratio of substance entailed through the name is diverse. He similarly follows Aristotle in defining univocals as those, quote, the name of which is common and the ratio of substance conveyed through the name is the same. What is important for our purposes is that in Aristotle's definition, quote, ratio is taken for the objective concept. Okay? So concepts or terms will be univocal which have the same name and the same objective concept corresponding to them. Whereas concepts or items or terms uh, will be uh, equivocal which have the same name but diverse objective concepts corresponding to them. Similarly, Mastery adds that, quote, an analogy signifies an objective concept in part the same and in part diverse. For it is diverse insofar as it signifies diverse objective rationes, and it is the same according to proportion, because proportion, since it posits some similitude from its intrinsic ratio, signifies also some unity even if it is imperfect. That was text three. So analogical concepts, or at least proportionally analogous concepts, are those which have the same name, but many rationes which are proportionally one, or one by similarity between them. Many Thomists agree with mastery in his characterization of what it take, of what it is for a concept or term to be univocal, equivocal, and analogous. John of St. Thomas, for instance, repeats the same classic definitions from Aristotle, which mastery gives, and similarly clarifies that ratio refers to the objective concept, and cites Cajetan as holding the same view. Similarly, he adds, quote, this is text four, uh, those things are called analogates of proportionality, the name of which is common, but the signified ratio is the same according to similitude or agreement of proportions. These broadly Cajetanian Thomists and these Scotists then agree that all that is required for the, for the concept of being to be univocal between God, substances, and accidents is for there to be an objective concept common to God, substances, and accidents. That is, that there can be objective precision between being and its inferiors. On the other hand, these Thomists will be right in thinking that the concept of being is analogous to God's substances and accidents if there are many rationes of being, which are one by analogy of proportionality, that is a certain similitude. So, our broadly Cajetanian Thomists think we form univocal concepts because there is some common nature that two things share. When we form the univocal concept of animal, we objectively prescind animality from rationality in man, allowing the prescinded ratio to be truly common to all animals. God, substances, and accidents, however, share neither a common nature nor any rationes. However, there is a certain similitude or of proportionality which God, substances, and accidents share with each other. Because of this similitude, a human can form an analogous formal concept of being, which is a confused cognition of all the beings that is, God, substances, and accidents. We saw this in Andreas's talk as well. As Kajetan explains, there is a certain sense in which an analogon, such as being, is abstracted from the analogous, such as substance and accident. This is a quote from Kajetan. The reason is not that the analogon expresses some ratio common to them, because this is foolishness. The reason is that it unifies them proportionally, signifies them as the same proportionally, and thus presents them to be considered as the same concealing, as it were, the inseparably concomitant diversity. It both unites the diversity of rationes by proportional identity and confuses them in a certain way. Kajetan proceeds to argue extensively against Scotus that these analogous concepts can validly serve as middle terms and syllogisms, can be used to compare the, analogon, the, the analogates in the analogon, for instance, that substance is more of a being than an accident, and that uh, they can serve as uh, the basis for a contradiction. Uh, for example, it's a contradiction to both affirm and deny that something is a being. Okay, so this is the general picture of how these Thomists think we can form an analogous concept of being, but a univocal concept of a genus, such as animal. The latter is through an act of objective precision to find a common ratio, and the former is through confusedly cognizing all of the rationes as being proportionally similar. Now we turn to the Jesuit nominal nominalists. What the Jesuit nominalists are doing in the, in the early 17th century is they're simply taking the same story that these Thomists tell to explain how we cognize being, but expanding it to also apply to our genus and species concepts. On their view, every being is per se singular, and there are no common natures, right? They're nominalists. Nevertheless, everything is more or less similar to everything else. For example, humans are very similar to each other, 
and animals have a certain but lesser degree of similarity amongst themselves. Because of this similitude, humans can formally prescind, forming a formal concept of, for example, man, which is, a, which is simply a confused cognition of all humans as they are one by similitude. Following suit, all of the grades of the Porphyrian tree are cognized in the same way the Thomists think being is cognized, namely that even though they lack a common nature or ratio, their similitude and proportion allows them to be confusedly cognized together indistinctly. Now, is this confused concept of animality, for example, a univocal or analogical concept? According to the nominalists, it's univocal, but this is because they have a very different understanding of what it is to be univocal than the one agreed upon by our Thomists and Scotists. When, for instance, Ariaga defines univocity, he cites the very same text from Aristotle that Mastery and John of St. Thomas cites, but he clarifies it in a very different way. This is text five. He gives a definition then says, from which definition, it is certain that for univocity is required firstly, a plurality of things which are signified by the same name. Okay, that's the same. Secondly, those things ought to be entirely similar between themselves insofar as they are signified through that name. For example, man and horse in the ratio of animal because though a parte re, they do not entirely agree, nevertheless, through the word ratio, only the agreement of these between themselves is expressed, and thus, as they are signified through this name, and through the mingled thing corresponding to this name, they are entirely similar. So for Ariaga, the concept of man is univocal between Socrates and Plato, not because there is one objective concept with one ratio corresponding to it, namely humanity, which is common to Socrates and Plato, but instead, it's univocal because the word man picks out Socrates and Plato only insofar as they are exactly similar. Simil similarly, words or concepts are equivocal, which pick out things as dissimilar, whereas words or comp concepts are analogous, which picks things out as similar, but not exactly similar. Put aside Ariaga's definitions, however. If we simply stipulate the definitions agreed upon by our Thomists and Scotists, how are we to understand the view of the Jesuit nominalists? Remember, because they reject objective precision, they do not think that the formal concept of man or of animality have the objective concepts of humanity and animality corresponding to them. Instead, as Ariaga explained, the formal concept of man and of animality have many rationes corresponding to them, namely all humans confusedly cognized and all animals confusedly cognized as they are similar. Therefore, given the definitions of univocity and analogy agreed upon by our Thomists and Scotists, Ariaga and the Jesuit nominalists hold that genus and species terms are predicated analogically and not univocally of distinct individuals in the same genus or species. For example, that human is predicated analogically of Socrates and Plato, and animal is predicated analogically of Socrates and a horse. Again, Ariaga and the other Jesuit nominalists don't say that in those words but that's because they offer different definitions of analogy and univocity than the one offered by our group of Thomists and Scotists. However, stipulating the definitions given by the latter, this is in fact the view held by these Jesuit nominalists. We are now in a position to make Scotus's symmetry challenge a little more precise. If Scotus is right, then these Thomists should be unable, unable to argue against these nominalists in a way that puts much pressure on them. The Thomists won't be able to show that analogy doesn't go all the way down, rather than merely staying at the level of being. I will soon, I will, as I will soon show, I think Scotus is right about this. However, I want to be very clear of what I am claiming. I am not claiming that the Thomistic position is inconsistent, contradictory, or even false. I am making a weaker point, namely that the Thomist, or at least this kind of broadly Cajetanian Thomist, is in a difficult dialectical position. The Thomist needs to insist against the Scotist that an analogous concept of being can play all the roles and have all the features everyone agrees it needs to, but that the analogous genus and species concepts are unable to do this, requiring us to posit univocal ones instead. This position, though it may be true, is very difficult to argue for. And the structural inability to effectively argue against an opposing position is a cost for the view. Before we can reach any conclusions, however, we must first look at the arguments. Okay, the Thomistic arguments against the Jesuit nominalists. I cite here uh, on, the, on the handout the two, uh, it's on the, the second page, 
the two main arguments given by the Thomists against the Jesuit nominalist position, where they try to show that there is objective precision between the metaphysical grades of the Porphyrian tree. If the Thomists can show there is objective precision there, they thereby show that there is one objective concept and common ratio for each metaphysical grade, and thus that our genus and species concepts are univocal. The first argument, uh, which is frequently given, I will call the cognizability argument. It is defended by the polliner Francisco Palanco, the Dominican Juan Villalva, the discalced Carmelite Gabriel a Concepcion, and the Italian Dominican Giovanni Siri, all of, uh, all of whom are Thomists from the 18th century. Um, I needed to go all the way into the 18th century to find, finally find Thomists who were objecting to the Jesuit nominalists. They just weren't reading them in the 17th century for some reason. Um, so that's why these are all uh, lesser known names that took them a while to, uh, to update uh, what was going on with their confrères in another order. So here's uh, Polanco's version of the cognizability argument from text six. When one formality identified with another is cognized, with the other not having been cognized, there is objective precision. But animal identified with rational is cognized, not having cognized rational. Therefore, between animal and, and rational, there is objective precision. But the minor, which is alone denied from the opposition, is proved by supposing a case where a man is seen walking from a long way off. And because of a difference, uh, though we cognize that he, uh, uh, sorry, I think it's because of the distance, uh, if I recall. Though we cognize uh, that he is an animal because he moves, nevertheless, we are ignorant that he is uh, rational or a human. In this case, animality is cognized and rationality is not cognized. The argument can be summarized in the way seen on the handout. This is uh, premise one, uh, two, and three there, which I won't read. Premise one is undisputed. Given the understanding of objective precision given above, one simply follows. Premise two is the premise under dispute, as Polanco correctly notes. You can see in the quote Polanco's argument in favor of it. He says that we can cognize someone as an animal because we can see them move, but be ignorant whether they are rational or not. As such, we cognize their animality, but not their rationality. The problem is that the Scotists, however, can make an almost identical argument for the objective precision of being from its inferiors, a point driven home by the 17th century Czech Scotist Bernard Sonic. This is text seven. Here's an argument that Sonic gives. Because animal entails an objective concept univocal with respect to man and brute, therefore the same should be said about real being with respect to God and creatures, substance and accident. The consequence holds by parity of reasoning. For as the objective concept of real being stands in the same way with respect to its inferiors as animal stands with respect to man and brute. For just as animal can be cognized while not cognizing rational, so too being can be cognized while not cognizing the ratio of accident. Sonic here makes the same point that I'm driving at. If it is true that we can cognize animality without cognizing rationa rationality, because we can know that something is an animal but be ignorant whether it is rational or not, then surely we can cognize being without cognizing substance or accident because we can know that something exists, but not know whether it is a substance or an accident, as Scotus asserts in his famous certain and doubtful argument. Um, the two, two common examples are light and a, a host, which you, you don't know whether it's been transubstantiated or not. Um, this leaves the Scotus making the following argument. Uh, premise one is the same as given before, and uh, two and three, all we've done is sub out the terms uh, um, animality and rationality for, for substance and accident and man for being. Um, in a given substance, being and substance are identical and being can be cognized without substance being cognized. Therefore, there is objective precision between being and substance. Given that the Thomists and nominalists agree that two star is false, why should the nominalists think that two is true? After all, the reason given by the Thomists to reject two star can simply be employed to reject two as well. For instance, when John of St. Thomas responds to the objection stating that being can be cognized without the, its inferiors, he responds, uh, quote, the diverse inferiors explicitly considered with the mode of diversity do not belong to the notion of being in general, but the same inferior considered as implicitly contained in the proportional unity of the relation to existence do not belong to the concept of being in general. It should it should even be said that being in general is nothing else than a kind of entity understood confusedly. So John of St. Thomas thinks we can deny two star 
because we really cannot, cannot cognize being without cognizing its inferiors. Instead, what we have is a confused cognition of both. The Jesuit nom nominalists are happy to follow JST in rejecting two star on that very same basis. But then they also reject two on that same basis. The Thomists will need to say more if they expect the nominalists to feel the pressure to accept two, given that they both reject two star. Without that, the cognizability argument is dialectically ineffective. A second argument frequently used by the, by the, uh, by the Thomists against the Jesuit nominal, nominalists, I will call the contradictories argument. Uh, versions of it are given by Villalva, Gabriel Concepcion, and Siri. Siri, and this is in text eight, says that contradictory predicates can be predicated of different metaphysical grades, so there must be an objective, distinct, an, an objective distinction between them. Quote, for example, man through animality agrees in reality with a beast, and does not disagree with him in reality through rationality, but to agree in reality and not agree in reality are contradictory propositions in reality, therefore, etc. The argument essentially goes like this. Um, and again, I won't, for, for sake of time, I won't read the argument, but uh, it's just a, a formalization of, of what Siri just said. Again, premise four is agreed upon by all parties. Premise five is the controversial one. What's important for our purposes, however, is that the Scotist can make a very similar argument about being, a point driven home again by Sonic, in fact, the very same text, text nine. Uh, because animal entails an objective concept univocal with respect to man and brute, therefore the same should be said about real being with respect to God and creatures, substance and accidents, consequence holds by parity of reasoning, for as objective concept of real being stands in the same way with respect to its inferiors as animal stands with respect to man and brute, here we go. Uh, just as man is similar to brute in the ratio of animal and not in rationality, so too accident is similar to substance in the ratio of being, but not in the ratio of perseity or inherence, therefore, etc. Essentially, the scotist can give the following argument. Again, premise four is the same. Premise five, uh, just a mirror, uh, five star is just a mirror of five. Again, subbing, uh, subbing uh, the, the, the correct terms, mutatis mutandis, Coming to the conclusion, therefore, in six star, that there is objective precision between being and perseity. I have not, as it stands, I have not found any Thomist who explicitly responds, responds to this argument. But given their view, I think they should respond in this way. Deny five star. In fact, substance is similar to accident, but not completely so. And we cannot isolate the exact way in which substance is similar to accident, and the exact way in which they are dissimilar. The simple nature of substance is similar to the simple nature of accident, but uh, without there being any common nature or ratio between them. But if this response works as a way to deny five star, the nominalists can use it to deny five. A human is similar to a beast, but not completely so. And we cannot isolate the exact way in which a human is similar to a beast and the exact way in which they are dissimilar. There is no common nature or ratio between them, but they are similar nevertheless. Like the previous argument, it seems to me that given uh, that the Thomists and nominalists agree that five star is false, the nominalists can then apply the same reasoning to reject five, rendering the argument dialectically ineffective. Um, I will say that there are uh, at least two other arguments I found given by the, the, the Thomists against the nominalists, but we don't, and there, there's more with these two. They give a bunch of different responses, but I think the same problems emerge for all these and we don't have time to, to do more. So we're gonna stick ourselves with that. Um, but that's, a, that's an IOU. Uh, okay. These arguments then are ineffective and rely on premises which are easily rejected using the very machinery that the Thomists themselves think work perfectly in other cases. The Thomists I have sampled seem generally unaware of this problem. The exception to this rule is Siri. He uh, has a greater recognition of the problem. I don't think he really, I don't think he gets it all the way, but he, he sees that there is an issue. And he thinks he has a solution. We turn now to series symmetry breaker. Okay. In the section, also, uh, I would, as, a, as an aside, I would recommend Giovanni Siri to my uh, Thomist uh, colleagues in the room. He's a pretty interesting guy. I'd never read him before, but he, he explicitly gauge, engages with Ariaga and Mastery and, and others and is worth it for that reason, um, despite what I'm about to say. So, um, in this section of the Universa Philosophia by Siri, uh, concerned with the univocity versus the analogy of being, 
Siri notes in an objection the similarity between the issue of whether there is an objective precision between the metaphysical grades and whether there is objective precision between being and its inferiors. He thinks, though, that there, that there is an important difference between the two cases, which can serve as a symmetry breaker. He points out in text 10 that there, quote, uh, not only does animal prescind from rational, but also rational prescinds from animal. For whenever there is precision, it ought to be mutual. Nor can there be non-mutual precision. Moreover, for this reason, rationality prescinds from animality, but differences do not prescind from being, because otherwise it would be prescinded from itself. Siri's thought is that the difference between the two cases is that in the case of the metaphysical grades, there is no problem in mutually prescinding a genus from a species and a species from a genus. Animality can be cognized uh, without rationality, and rationality can be cognized without animality. However, Siri thinks this cannot happen in the case of being. One might think that we can cognize being without cognizing its inferiors, such as perseity, but Siri maintains it is a very important principle that you can't cognize the inferiors of being without cognizing being. For example, uh, we cannot cognize perseity without being. Everything is a being all the way through, including differences in the inferiors of being. If that's right, then we can't cognize perseity without cognizing being, since perseity is a kind of being. Siri then adds the premise that precision must be mutual. Given these two principles, then, Siri thinks he has found a principled difference between the two cases. The nominalist should accept the arguments for objective precision between the metaphysical grades, but reject the argument, the arguments along with the Thomists, for the objective precision from being from its inferiors, because the latter view would require non-mutual precision, which is impossible, unlike the former view. Okay. It seems to me that, however, Siri's symmetry breaker ultimately fails as a response to Scotus's symmetry challenge. First, Siri offers the nominalist no reason to think that precision has to be mutual in order to count as precision. In fact, Ariaga and Suarez and many others explicitly hold that precision can be non-mutual. And until Siri gives the nominalist a reason to think that precision has to be mutual, the nominalist should be completely unmoved by this. Uh, the second reason is uh, this. Um, Siri needs to do more than point out a difference between the two cases. He needs to point out a difference which can then be used to put pressure on the nominalist. That is, um, he needs to point out a difference that can be used uh, to pressure the nominalist to accept premise two and premise five. Um, but I think he can't do that. Here's why. Okay. When Siri says that um, precision has to be mutual, he's speaking either of objective or formal precision, okay. or both. If he's speaking of formal precision or both, then on the contrary. Um, uh, Siri himself admits that we can cognize man without animal, uh, that we cannot, sorry, Siri himself admits that we cannot cognize man without animal, but uh, we can cognize animal without man using an inadequate concept. So Siri himself thinks that in cases of formal precision, you can't have non-mutual uh, uh, precision. Okay, on the other horn, let's say he means objective concepts. Um, so if Siri asserts that uh, the objective precision has to be mutual, the nominalist can say, okay, fine but we didn't think there was objective precision anyway. How does this pressure us to accept premise two or five? We still have the same response. It's still open to us. So uh, either way, uh, uh, it, it doesn't put pressure on the nominalist at all, I think, to accept the uh, premise two or premise five and therefore the conclusion. As such, uh, series symmetry breaker fails to do its job. Okay, the conclusion. It will be helpful here to summarize my case. There are a certain group of Thomists, led by Cajetan and John of St. Thomas, who think that, a, uh, that univocity obtains when there is one term predicated with one and the same corresponding objective concept in each case. These Thomists also want to say that the concept of being is not univocal in this way, while our genus and species concepts are. Scotus's symmetry challenge to them is that they cannot consistently argue for this position in a dialectically effective way. Given the Jesuit, that the Jesuit nominalists hold the position that in fact both being and genus and species concepts are analogical, 
again, stipulating the definitions of univocity agreed upon earlier, um, they are a perfect test case to evaluate SCOTUS's challenge. As it happens, the arguments that the Thomists use against these Jesuit nominalists to show that our genus and species concepts are univocal are just versions of arguments used by Scotists to show that our concept of being is univocal. Because both the nominalists and the Thomists agree that these Scotist arguments fail, the nominalists should feel no pressure to accept the Thomistic arguments used against them. Only Siri seems to be aware, aware of this problem, but his symmetry breaker fails to do the job. And again, I want to reiterate, none of this shows that the Thomistic position is inconsistent or contradictory. But it does show, if I'm right, that the Thomists are in a difficult dialectical position. They cannot argue for their position against one side without thereby providing the other sides with the tools they need to disagree with them, a position that, that's not good to be in, and a cost for the view to be in such a dialectically ineffective state. In the end, it seems to me that Scotus may be right. If the Thomistic defense of analogy works at all, it may work too effectively, rendering it difficult to defend the univocity of other concepts too from the more really committed, from the people who are more really committed to analogy, namely the Jesuit nominalists. Thank you.